Uh, by June of 2022, uh, Jeff Gehrman had caused a lot of problems for the public administrator, uh, Robert Tellis. Uh, he had written articles uh, accusing Mr. Tellis of an inappropriate relationship. He had written that he um, was bullying in the office and had created a, a hostile environment in the public administrator's office. He had written an article saying that the management of Mr. Tellis was so bad that the county had to bring in a private consultant in order to assist with the management of an eight person office. After uh, Mr. Gehrman wrote those articles, um, Mr. Tellis uh, lost his primary race and would not be the public administrator after that. And not just that he lost the race, he lost the race to a rival within the public administrator's office itself. And from the text messages of Mr. Tellis, we learned that this was deeply, deeply troubling for him. He wrote to Mr. Gehrman, I don't know what to say. I told you how, how much this all impacted me. You heard from employees who are being harassed by these people, provided you, I think this is a typo proof, that I was doing my best to actually smooth things over. I had to make hard decisions. Still, you wrote an article that makes it sound like I'm the guilty one. That wasn't fair or balanced. He told Mr. Gehrman, I'm distraught right now. Clearly, there are typos in, uh, in my message. He told Mr. Gehrman that he was adding to the pressure of his life. I've done so much for that office. I told you that I've been followed and that I caught Rita following me. You decided to take it on her word that she wasn't. However, clearly she was. It seems to me that you value sensationalism or the value of potential or a potential takedown than actually telling the truth. Thank you for helping him drop more pressure on my life. Now, Mr. Gehrman's response was a response that you get probably from many reporters. He says, sorry you feel that way. My editors and I feel the story, uh, is, the story is fair and balanced. Mr. Tellis's response, I don't know that you could truly feel that. You have concrete proof I provided you of what is really going on. You acknowledge much of it. You, still, you mention none of it. If telling yourself that you were fair helps you sleep at night while you're trying to destroy good people, that's your prerogative. And Mr. Tellis does attempt to fight back from these articles on his campaign website. He posts this letter discrediting the paper and discrediting the uh, allegations in those articles uh, written by Mr. Gehrman. He goes on Twitter and he accuses Mr. Gehrman of being a bully. Um, he says Mr. Gehrman had threatened him. He told other people on social media um, in this first, this first screenshot that because of those articles, I had to increase my medication to cope with it all. He tells someone who reposted the article or sent it that he was deeply disappointed that they had done that. And he's generally following the fallout of those articles on social media. But the reality is he lost that primary election after those articles were written and he attributed it to the articles written by Jeff Gehrman. He told his best employee, Nicole Lofton, unfortunately, too many people bought the lies. He told his best employee, Nicole Lofton, I'm so sorry, I'm devastated that everything we work for is going to be done. I hate them and what they did. And after all that happened and losing the primary, his concern was that another article might be coming. He explains, I'm gonna pull the trigger on the supervisory changes. I'm going to go with the original plan. I think if I do any more than that, they will say I'm interfering with operations. And then he added, she is probably trying to get fodder to pass to the reporter. And he sent another text after that, that there's more garbage being gathered um, for a news article. And Mr. Tellis testified to you that after the primary took place, he actually um, half drafted, he didn't file it, a lawsuit um, where he was going to sue his uh, rival, Rita Reed, and he was going to insinuate in that lawsuit, coincidentally, that there was a conspiracy that caused the, his problems in the election. If you look at point 21, he wrote, upon information and belief, 
Several employees conspired to make false allegations of mistreatment by Mr. Tellis. These employees contacted the Las Vegas Review Journal to share false and defamatory statements in support of news articles against Mr. Tellis. So he was clearly incredibly upset that those articles were written and that it resulted in him losing that primary. In July, Jeff Gehrman, though, isn't done with his uh, stories and his um, examination of what is going on with Mr. Tellis and the public, administrator, public administrator's office. In July, he sends that request for the public records of the county where he's asking for communication between Mr. Tellis and Roberta, and then ultimately it expands to other individuals in the county. But he wants all team messages between Mr. Tellis and Roberta. He wants cell phone messages. He wants essentially all of their communications as of July. And that's after those four articles were written. Mr. Tellis, of course, is informed by this, uh, for, informed of this request by the county. And this occurs on August the 8th. And they explain, hey, look, this reporter's seeking all of this information. So the message underlying all of this is another article is forthcoming. Mr. Tellis messages back that he wants to review those communications prior to them being released to the reporter. But as of August 8th, he's on notice of another article coming. And if you look at this email, he responds, of, oops, he responds about 20 minutes after that first email was sent to him. Now, looking at the August calendar, you can see that on August the 8th, that's when he receives the notification of the public records request. And by August the 12th, there are images from Google Maps of Jeff Gehrman's neighborhood, Bronze Circle. We don't know the date they were created, but we know they were modified by August the 13th, meaning they had to be created sometime before that. Now, this doesn't mean that Mr. Tellis physically went to Bronze Circle on the days leading up to uh, the modification date of the 13th. It simply means that he went and accessed Google Maps and Bronze Circle is the area that was searched and accessed by his, uh, accessed by his phone. And those images are, of course, where Jeff Gehrman lives. Now, the next date to keep in mind in our series of events in August of 22 is August the 15th. And August the 15th, that is when there's uh, images of all of those cars that are uh, kind of driving along the access road to Jeff Gehrman's neighborhood. Now, once again, we have a modification date. That doesn't mean that the images were all taken on the 15th, but they had to exist before the 15th to be modified on that date. And if you recall, just a, a Detective Gaddis figured out where this was, and it's right off of Mr. Gehrman's neighborhood. He, his house right, is right here on Bronze Circle. And she figured out by looking at the photographs where it was located in Las Vegas. And she figured out it was located right at this Popeye's parking lot. And that slanted wall ends up being um, in almost all of the images. And there are a lot of them, of several cars driving by the access road to Mr. Uh, Garvin's house. So we have the notification on the 8th. We have accessing Google Maps on the 12th. We have those screenshots of all of those vehicles in, uh, in conjunction with Mr. Gehrman's neighborhood by the 15th. And then by the 23rd, there have been searches of Mr. Gehrman's personal information on Mr. Tellis's computer. This is Mr. Tellis's work computer at his desk. If you look at the screen on the right, you can see like there's a bottle of hand sanitizer, kind of there's an arrow pointing to it. Here's a closer view. And the screenshots from his phone, you can see that the same um, cap to that bottle is uh, in the screenshot as well. So these were clearly taken uh, on his work computer while he was at work. And you can see that he's looking up personal information of Mr. Gehrman, the kind of car he drives. He ultimately is able to get um, the address of 7216 off his work computer. 
And once again, those photos were in existence by August the 23rd of 2022. So all of those events, the notification, the accessing of Bronze Circle on Google Maps, the screenshots of the car, and then using the work computer to access personal information of Jeff uh, Garman all occurs in August of 2022. Moving to September, that's when Mr. Tellis on September the 1st receives notification that the county is getting ready to release all of that, uh, all of those documents that were subject to the uh, public records request. He's notified and Ms. Kennan is notified on September the 1st of 2022 and the murders the very next day. It's about 15 hours later. Now we know that on the morning of the 2nd, um, Mr. Tellis left his house and proceeded into the area of Mr. Uh, Garman's neighborhood and that he kind of meanders ar ar around there, but ultimately ends up on those cross streets and then proceeds on foot to Mr. Garman's residence. Mr. Tellis's residence is at the top of the screen there on Spanish Steps. He goes down that Silk Tassel Road and then goes on Red Hills Road. and he leaves at 9.12 in the morning. Now, eventually, he's in the area of Rock Springs Drive, which is near Mr. Gehrman's neighborhood. The time on that video is incorrect. It says 9.42 a.m., but you heard from Detective Mogg that uh, the corrected time for that particular camera is 10.26. So he's in the area of Mr. Gehrman's neighborhood at about 10.26 a.m. in the morning. What's the next thing that happens? Well, you know that um, this is Mrs. Tellis's uh, Apple Watch, and she sends that message to Mr. Tellis at 10.35 a.m. You can kind of see it says Friday, 10.35 a.m. And the message is, where are you? Well, he's sitting in Mr. Gehrman's neighborhood, so he's not answering this text message. That text message goes unanswered. Mr. Tellis at 10.40 a.m. is now on Winter Green Drive, which is the cross street to uh, Bronze Circle. He's on Winter Green Drive at about 11 a.m. And the murder itself takes place at about 11.18 a.m. Then Mr. Tellis is back at his own neighborhood by 11.51 a.m. And this is video from that Piggott Elementary School which Detective Mogg indicated that that timestamp is correct. And what does he do? He gets back at 11.51 a.m. And then he's able to get his BMW and proceed to Planet Fitness. So there's his BMW leaving, it's 12.03, and then you know from Detective Gaddis's testimony that it's about a four to six minute drive. He's able to be at Planet Fitness by 12.09. So by 9.03, which is now the day after the murder, it has been reported that Jeff Garriman has been murdered. Um, and then Roberta, who is working, um, has heard about the murder and she's starting to get concerned. She tells Mr. Tellis, I'm working tomorrow now. I don't wanna be in the office alone. I'd rather be with the, the crazy women than alone, than alone right now. She's concerned about Mr. Gehrman getting murdered and she's scared about being in the office alone. By September 5th and 6th, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department has released images of the assailant and also of the, uh, the Yukon itself. And Roberta becomes even more concerned. She messages Mr. Tellis, Rob, WTF, please do not be driving your Yukon around for a while. This is on the, uh, September the 6th. He answers, whoa, that's crazy. She says, please tell me your Yukon is not that color. 
He answers, it is similar, if not the same. She says, I'm freaking out, Rob. He answers, my car has all matching wheel patterns. I think they are saying that there's a difference between the front and the back of the assailant's vehicle. But Roberta looks at it and says, oh, your car is identical. And it actually turns out that Roberta is the one that is correct. His car is identical. From that lighter spot um, on the passenger side, just below the windshield wiper, there's sort of like a lighter rectangular shaped uh, <coughs> portion of the car. You can see that in the video from the differentiating tint between the front and the back of the vehicle, that part is identical. And from the wheels themselves, they weren't different. They were the same. The wheel rims on the front and the back are identical. It is his Yukon. He is the one who committed the murder. So let's talk about the charge of murder. Murder is the unlawful killing of a human being with malice of forethought, either expressed or implied. And all that means is an act of uh, ill will. When you go back to deliberate, you'll be asked two overarching general questions about the crime. Um, and those are, was a deadly weapon used in the commission of the crime? And was the victim of the crime 60 years of age or older? So as you heard from Judge Levitt, a deadly weapon is simply, some, is simply an object capable of causing substantial bodily harm or death. We obviously have that in this case, the knife wounds inflicted on Mr. Gehrman were definitely not caused by human hands and they were capable of uh, causing substantial bodily harm or death because that's ultimately what happened. You may be asking, well, where is it? Like that, that knife didn't come to court, but the instructions tell you that the state is not required to have recovered a deadly weapon used in an alleged crime or to produce it at trial. You just have to be able to gather from the evidence that a deadly weapon was used. Obviously, the injuries of Mr. Gehrman indicate that this was not caused by human hands. These, a deadly weapon was used to accomplish his murder. So that overarching question about the crime is probably an easy one to answer. Probably the easiest one after that is, um, was Mr. Gehrman over 60 years old at the time the crime occurred? and he was 69 uh, years old at the time it occurred. So let's talk about first degree murder. Um, as Judge Levitt explained to you, there are three theories, um, three pathways that you can reach a verdict of first degree murder. The first one is a willful, deliberate, and premeditated murder. The second one is murder perpetrated by means of lying in wait. And the third one is mur murder perpetrated uh, during uh, the course of elder abuse. Now, the first form of first degree murder is probably the one you're the most familiar with. Um, and that is a murder that is willful, deliberate, and premeditated. And you'd have to find all of those elements in order to uh, find Mr. Tellis guilty under that theory of first degree murder. So let's talk about what each of these mean. Willfulness is very simple. It's simply an intent to kill. Do your actions demonstrate an intent to kill?
So this part of the video takes about <laughs> two minutes. The entire time of that two minutes, Mr. Tellis is attacking Mr. Garriman with a weapon. So that demonstrates an intent to kill. He's stabbing him repeatedly. Mr. Garriman I, is clearly trying to fight back, but Mr. Tellis doesn't stop. It keeps going and going and going. And it's kind of a long time to be inflicting injuries on another individual. He finally walks out on the side. But the duration of that time, the entire time, Mr. Gehrman is being attacked. So let's talk about deliberation, which is the second element. Um, deliberation is determining upon a course of action to kill as a result of thought, including weighing the reasons for and against the action. Well, what do we know about Mr. Tellis's actions prior to the murder? Well, we know back in August, when he got notification that another story was likely coming, he kind of goes into research mode on uh, Mr. Garman, where he's located, what kind of car he might be driving, searches on his computer. All of that demonstrates deliberation. Even if you didn't have all of these actions back in August, the length of time of the actual attack itself is sort of a shorter version demonstrating a course of action to kill, right? In the course of two minutes, you, you are stabbing someone multiple times, you could change your mind, but he doesn't do that. He keeps going and going and going, not even withstanding all this pre-planning. Now, premeditation is the last element of that first theory of first degree murder, and that is simply a decision to kill before you do it. Um, before you came in and, and sat as jurors, um, you may have thought that premeditation is always a case of pre-planning and months in advance and that sort of thing. And that is definitely a case of first degree murder and kind of uh, exactly what we have in this case. But you're told by the instruction that premeditation need not be for a day, an hour, or even a minute. It can be as instantaneous as successive thoughts of the mind. So what that instruction tells you is in the law of Nevada for premeditation, if I make a decision to kill you and I do it a month from now, that's premeditation. If I make a decision to kill and I do it a week from now, that's premeditation. If I do it an hour later, it's premeditation. If I do it a minute later, it's premeditation. If I do it a second later, it's still premeditation. And you have a video of the attack on Mr. Gehrman, and clearly, clearly there's a decision made to kill him. But beyond that, you also know that Mr. Tellis took the step of leaving his phone at home prior to the murder. That's indication of premeditation and planning. You know that he bothered to disguise himself uh, by wearing the hat and the orange outfit that shows premeditation, a decision to kill. And you also know, most of all, that he brought a weapon over to Mr. Garman's house, and that shows premeditation as well. So that theory of first degree murder has been established in this case. Let's talk about the second theory of first degree murder, which is uh, murder perpetrated by means of lying in wait. And the ex instructions explain what that is. Another theory of first degree murder is murder perpetrated by means of lying in wait. And what that is, is kind of taking on a place of concealment in order to inflict injury or death upon another person. Um, it's sort of the second, par or the second paragraph, it says, watching, waiting, and concealment from the person killed with the intention of inflicting serious bodily harm upon or serious bodily injury upon such person or of killing such a person. And in this case, you actually see the actions of Mr. Tellus literally lying in wait. He goes into Mr. Gehrman's yard and recedes to the back in order to be in a place of concealment in order to attack him later on. And that is literally lying in wait. 
So that theory of first degree murder is established as well. The third theory of first degree murder is murder perpetrating or murder occurring during the perpetration of abuse of an older person. And this is kind of like the like child abuse, where if you abuse a child and a child happens to die in the course of abuse, it's automatically first degree murder. The same is true for individuals who are over 60. If you abuse an older person and they die during the course of that abuse, that is an automatic case of first degree murder. And it's sort of a policy judgment to protect vulnerable members of our society. The instructions tell you another theory of first degree murder is a kind of murder which carries with it conclusive evidence of malice of forethought. One of these classes of murder is murder committed in the perpetration or attempted perpetration of abuse of an older person. Therefore, a killing which is committed in the perpetration or attempted perpetration of an older person is deemed to be murder of the first degree, whether the killing was intentional, unintentional, or accidental. We have that in this case. Mr. Gehrman was um, over 60 years old. So by abusing him and causing his death, it is automatically another theory of first degree murder. So this is sort of uh, this is a picture of the verdict form that you'll have um, back in your deliberation room. And you can kind of see on the on the top in all caps, it says murder with use of a deadly weapon, victim 60 years of age or older. That was those very first two questions I discussed with you at the beginning of the closing that you would you would answer as jurors. And then as a jury, you should ask about the individual theories of first degree murder and vote on them. So you have to vote if all 12 of you think that this was a willful, deliberate, and premeditated murder. Do all 12 of you find that it was perpetrated by means of lying in wait? Do all 12 of you agree that it was perpetrated uh, of, of a, in the course of abuse of an older person? If you find all of those, then you mark those boxes. If you are in disagreement, say only three of you think it was willful, deliberate, and premeditated or some combination, you have to take a vote to decide if all of you believe that it's first degree murder under some theory. And if it is, you mark that last box and say, we don't find unanimously under any of those three theories, but we all of us agree, 12 of us agree that it's some form of first degree murder. The law tells you, although your verdict must be unanimous as to charge, you do not have to agree, to agree on a theory of guilt or liability. So if all 12 of you agree one form of first degree murder, then you um, mark that last box. But it's the state's position that all three of those theories, willful, deliberate, premeditated, lying in wait, and elder abuse clearly apply in this case. And really, Mr. Tellis isn't um, disagreeing that this is uh, a case of first degree murder. He's just saying that it was a Compass Realty assassin who did it. Now here we see Mr. Tellis leaving his house at about 9, 12 a.m. And it's the state's theory, of course, that at that point he's left his house and his cell phone is sitting back at his house on Spanish steps. The state's theory is that Mr. Tellis leaves his residence, leaves the phone at the residence and is proceeding to um, Mr. Gehrman's residence. And as we've discussed, the Yukon is seen at Rock Springs at about 1026 a.m. There's two different images of it. Meanwhile, Mr. Tellis's cell phone, which is sitting back at Spanish Steps, is getting some incoming messages. There's an incoming and un unanswered message at about 9.44 a.m. about a work case. There's an incoming and unanswered message at about 10.16 about another case at his work. There's an incoming unanswered message from his wife saying, where are you at 1036 AM? Now you'd think given that some of the allegations in the articles, this might be one he'd answer pretty quickly. Um, there's an unanswered incoming call from his wife at 1043 AM that doesn't get answered by him. And there's another incoming call that occurs um, at 1116 AM. Meanwhile, you know, he, is at Mr. Gehrman's house. So ask yourself this, if this was really a Compass Realty assassin who was committing the murder at Ron's Circle, how would that individual know that Mr. Tellis 
with his phone at his house wouldn't have answered a call or wouldn't have gotten in another text stream or wouldn't have made a call himself. How could anybody but Mr. Tellis be the killer? No one would have that level of assurance because if any of those calls had been answered from his house, it would be clear that he wasn't the one involved. Now we know um, from the video uh, evidence from Braun Circle that after the murder occurs, Mr. Tellis actually returns to Mr. Garman's house and he goes to the side uh, area of the yard where Mr. Garman is located. And then he returns back to the Yukon. And eventually does that U-turn and drives away. But if you're wondering why there isn't blood in the Yukon, he had to walk all the way out of that crime scene and anything that had been deposited on his shoes would have come off in the rocks. Besides that, the crime scene itself is not drenched in blood on the ground. These are Mr. Garman's shoes. There, there, is some blood, there is some blood on them, but they're not exactly drenched, and he's the victim. So after Mr. Tellis come, leaves Bronze Circle for the second time, he goes east, he goes on Wintergreen, he goes on Washington, he goes on Rampart, um, he goes on Apple, and he goes back to his neighborhood at 1151, and then he leaves again to go to Spanish, uh, to go to Planet Fitness at about 1203. You also know that Mr. Tellis is the killer because of the DNA evidence in this case. Remember how this comes into play. They collect uh, the samples from the scene and the Metro DNA analyst has this result of foreign DNA being present on September the 5th. They haven't even collected a DNA sample from Mr. Tellis until the 7th. So it's not like Metro or Compass Realty has a sample of Mr. Tellis's DNA to come insert in this crime scene. It's Mr. Tellis's DNA in this uh, scene. It's literally on the body of Mr. Garman. The items from the search warrant also tell you that Mr. Tellis is the person responsible from, for this crime. Those shoes that were found in the house, they weren't planted, they were hidden. They were cut up. Anyone who planted the shoes would have no reason to cut them up. The cutting up is to benefit Mr. Tellis so he can get rid of them. If you were just planting them, you could leave them alone. And they're clearly his shoes because one, they're in his house. Two, his DNA is present on them. And if you don't believe that, there's pictures of in his phone of those shoes on a day when he apparently went rock climbing. You have the bag that was located and ultimately the hat as well. And you heard a lot of testimony about how all of this evidence was collected from the scene. Um, there's the detective who physically finds it, working with other detectives who are also doing the search. There's the detective that's assigned to be the scribe to write down where everything is located. There's a crime scene analyst assigned to photograph it in place. There's DNA analysts who actually analyze the physical evidence after the fact. And all of this occurred, this whole search occurred while his wife is sitting in the house 
and aware of what they're doing. None of this evidence was planted. There's the bag, there's the hat, that was the location of the hat in his house. Finally, you know from the searches of the uh, bronze circle where he accessed the Google Maps of Mr. Gehrman's house that he is the one responsible. He's not friends with Mr. Gehrman. He doesn't have business to do with Mr. Gehrman. There is no reason for images of bronze circle to be in his phone prior to the murder occurring. You also know that he is the one responsible from the sort of amateur surveillance that occurred in August prior to the murder itself. There's no reason for any of this to be in his phone, but that he's attempting to gather information on uh, Mr. Gehrman. And finally, you know he actually used his work computer to gather information on Mr. Gehrman as well. At the end of his testimony, I think yesterday, um, Mr. Tellis uh, explained that, um, you know, he's really a victim in this, you know, he, he's been victimized by the whole process. And he told you that um, he's, he was wronged by his coworkers who didn't appreciate his changes that he made in the office and didn't appreciate his management style. He was wronged by the county who didn't understand that he was being a good leader. Um, he was wronged by Zach Schilling, uh, it, you know, and by Kristen Riffle. He was wronged by them as well. Um, he was certainly wronged, according to him, by Compass Realty. Um, he was wronged by Steve Wolfson. He was wronged by the patrol officers who preserved that scene at Mr. Gehrman's house. He was wronged by Metro Police, in particular, Detective Gaddis and Detective Jappy. He was wronged by some mysterious, illusory uh, phone hacker. He was wronged by DNA analysts at Metro who found his DNA on the fingernails of Mr. Gehrman. And then, of course, he was obviously wronged by Mr. Gehrman Chu in the articles he wrote. Or maybe, maybe it's not that he was wronged. Maybe he's the one in the wrong. <laughs>